the last official Friday seminar of the year. Um, we still have Neville Clint coming in a couple of weeks, although once again you'll see another email from me, we're going to reschedule that one again. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to you on the exact timing of that. Um, as it's the student conference that morning, unfortunately, and we've, we've got our time mixed up. But um, Malcolm stepped in for today's presentation. Uh, unfortunately, Alice was I to make it today, but um, Malcolm kindly stepped in. It's, it's the second time he stepped in for a presentation on the Friday seminar, when the last time we had a person that missed out, Malcolm came in and um, chaired a session on the ESCC presentations. But um, this is actually Malcolm's, only Malcolm's second Friday seminar. His first was when he originally came to the JK in 2008. Seven. Seven. Um, so it's actually only his second Friday seminar, which is uh, amazing. I thought he'd done many more than that. He's done more in the, in the Tuesday morning meetings, I think. But um, Malcolm has been the JK for a while now, but he, he started off, for those of you who don't know, as a physicist. He did his undergraduate in, in physics um, before completing a, a PhD, oh, a MPhil, and then a PhD at, at UCT, um, and and then travelling around the world. He took, I think, two years to travel around the world, and four years in an old Land Rover. Um, so he's going to correct me the whole way through. So I don't actually have a proper biography. I'm going off my memory. <laughs> But from that, he, he came back and went to, to Mintech and then um, developed the Communication Research Group and Consulting Group at UCT before coming over to Australia to join JK. Um, he's, he's done some amazing things while he's been here um, and been in the, in the Communication Research space. He's developed the grind curves, which, which are utilized, at, once again, I saw them utilized at the Millops conference recently. Um, someone from over in New Zealand who was doing, um, at Waihi Gold, was doing some grind curves. Um, and then also his work with mill trajectories that came out, mill triage, that came out from his PhD. Um, and works out line and designs for, for sag mills. But today he's going to be presenting something on integrated process prediction. This is something that we've been working on for a while here at the JK. It's been kind of a, a group effort, but led by Malcolm's ideas. Um, and it's, it's been, I, I've really enjoyed being involved in the process of developing these, at least the images. I think the ideas all came from Malcolm's thoughts, and, and he sparks ideas as he does. Um, and then that got me really excited and creative around the, the imagery and how to present it in a Prezi format. So this is going to be a slightly different presentation from the, the standard PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully none of you get um, seasick from, from looking at it. I tried to avoid the kind of movement that you would normally see and that could make you seasick, but there are some bits where you spin around. So. <laughs> Hopefully that's not too disorientating for you. But I'll hand over to Malcolm, I'll just press record because we're going to have to use some new recording software. So hopefully this works. Well, welcome to my Friday morning seminar. It seems I'm only, I'm just brought in the last minute so I don't get formal invites. So I must be doing something wrong. <laughs> but uh, a real pleasure to be presenting at the JK. We have a, a bit of a problem that we go around it's espousing our theories and our visions to the world and we don't do it locally and we should really watch that. So this is something as Grant said we've been working on for some time and I guess the terminology began to cement only about 18 months ago and the pleasing thing is that it came from many people in the group. It's not a one-man show at all. I think I'm more of the conductor of the idea of sparking and and helping facilitate people come together, which is why I mentioned, other than Grant, who's done a lot of the physical work in the presentation, uh, the others just more by the types of groups, <coughs> some a little bit, and we'd like to have more of them in, more geologists, please, and uh, some a lot more. But it's, it's the platform. What I'm presenting is more a vision of a platform. It's a, it's a springboard for a discussion rather than presenting what we've done. What we've done is, is create the, the basis that I believe can really 
really move us forward. Just another little note on the introduction. I'm very pleased to have two members of my family here who especially come along this morning to cheer me up. <laughs> so integrated process prediction is really, surely, that's the holy grail of what we should be doing in mineral, in, in not just mineral processing, but in research and mining. What objective should be not just to solve one small problem at a time, but to, to be able to integrate many the whole the pro whole process chain into a solution, and that's not easy, which is why we really one of the reasons we haven't done it. And it's also functionally difficult because of the segmentation in the industry, as you you can get funding and support from bits of it, but you really struggle across the top end. So this is where we need the really senior people coming from the top end down to support initiatives like this. The process metallurgist can't actually support it. it needs to come from the top down. So in a strategic sense, we have to have a really good story to support going in at a high level to support this type of initiative. The good news is it doesn't have to be all in one project. If we understand what we do, we can build it as puzzle pieces. As long as the puzzle pieces link together and aren't floating as separate islands. That would be the objective of integrating the process. So what we would like is that we may be looking at the what is the resource that we want to change to reserve, which we want to change to a large hole in the ground. What is the, the technology behind that? What is the um, link from that to the processing? And then the processing from the big, big brown dirty plant, 99% lands up, stays where it is on the mine. And we now need to deal with that um, waste, I guess, is the common term. We try to not use it because it seems like a bad thing. But it's unused. And we now need to store it somewhere or, or process it in a way to make it safe and remain on site. So that entire process we'd like to have is an integrated one, not as handing over the problem to someone else. And that, that's on the brown fields. And green fields, we'd like to design it. What's our mine plan going to be? What is the geology, uh, the geological structures that dictate, because they ultimately dictate what the mine is going to be? And then how do we physically mine it? And what's the parts we should mine and shouldn't mine? I often plan without any view of what the processing might be. It's just, well, it'll process X amount. It doesn't matter about the process itself. That's a small, irrelevant part, which I always found slightly offensive as my entire life has been there working that. <laughs> And then the, the top bit is a plan for a tailing stand. How do we link these together in a planning sense? And we basically, as an industry, are able to do it, but not actually take advantage of, of linking the processes we're doing them independently. Let's look at what might drive us to, to change the modus operandi. I know this is commonly presented, but nice and clear with Grant's input of the, how the Productivity index, the nice big red line that it plummets, um, has affected the industry. And that doesn't mean we're all inefficient. But actually what's really interesting is as the price goes up, we become less efficient. Because there's, there's plenty. And that is actually a common driver in industry and life and humanity. That you don't have to be efficient when things are going easy. When they're tough, you become more efficient. So now we see efficiency looks like it's beginning to pick up again. But it's not just about building the fact. Part of that was developing big new mines. So the productivity per money going in goes down. So we can, we can reap the benefit of those, we hope. But the price going down, our cash costs have been going up, and you can see they started to go down. There really is a squeeze there, and I don't think that's going to reverse. The underlying thing is, of course, the great. So the big push to new production, then we went to, to parts of all bodies we wouldn't have mined before. They are deeper, they are finer grain, they are more difficult to recover. That's a physical reality we're dealing with. We're not dealing with a certain grade of steel coming into our factory. Our factory has to deal with what's in the ground. So it's way more challenging. What we need to do is understand what is in the ground and how it flows through to our process. We have really strong drivers that we didn't have even 30 years ago around our resources. So the water, what's available, Keeping it clean, I'd like my children, that is from my children, those are my children in the stream. Yeah, we'd still like their children to play in the streams and that there's still water in the stream. 
So those are drivers that we get nailed a lot in the mining industry. Everyone affected us, probably farming more than us. But we're really under the scrutiny for that. And we're in odd areas that can uh, cause a really big drain on the water resource. And then what about the energy? You have, for the first time, nailed the amount of energy, not with uncertainty, but with variability in our work. And that, that's improved, continuing in the seek work. That's you know, a third of the energy going into comminution. Our area of research, big area of research in the making, is comminution. So it's an important area to consider. If you're going to make a difference, you have to make a difference in there if you're going to make a difference to the energy. The other really big one, of course, is transport. Can we change the mine plan to reduce the transport costs? Absolutely. If you change from trucks to, to convey, slash is the transport energy. And then how we affect the, affect the environment. It's a slightly cheat slide. You might have not noticed it's the Rio Tinto. And that's an actual natural phenomenon in many ways. But we can't afford to have streams that look like this downstream of our mine site. And uh, that's an absolute no no these days. So, how do we deal with that? With the 99% we dispose of that can end up producing this. And then the other side, we had a a really nice presentation on Bougainville, an almost identical photograph just two weeks ago, I think. And here we have Bougainville and the, the remnants of it, and that's, that's a 70 kilometre scale with the massive tailings down the stream in the river, just washed down the river. And interestingly, <coughs> explained that the problem is tectonics and instability, and you couldn't put a dam, but there's no way you could put a mine in like that anymore, just no chance, won't let you do it. And I, I agree with that. So we need to deal with these, these issues. These are really strong drivers. And socially, I like this example, it's LKB mine in, in northern Sweden. And it's been going for more than 100 years. It's a sub-level cave. It, must, it might be the richest iron ore mine in the world. It's just a block of iron ore going down at a 70 degree angle. So there's sub-level sub cave, and it comes to the surface. And this is marching towards that town. It will swallow the town. But they have a plan in place. They've moved the railway line, they've moved some of the parts of the town already. The city hall will be disassembled and reassembled. Other buildings, I'm not sure if they just get sucked into the pit. But the mine and this community are building a new town on the other side of the hill. And uh, so socially, that's a plan worked out together. The community wouldn't exist without the mine, so they're kind of motivated to be part of it. And that's quite a reasonable plan. So socially, we are constrained. We can't just tell them to get lost. So we've got the drivers that we've got to push down, we've got a, a lower grade pushing us down, and things we've got to minimise, and we've got to improve our social licence to operate and improve profitability. If we don't have profit, we don't exist. So it is a bottom line. So my hypothesis, or my thesis is that we do need to transform, and it's, it's understood in the mining industry we need to transform, that it seems to be, we want transformational steps, but we'll do, we'll do a lot of little incremental no risk, low risk activities to do that. Because the, the problem is we can't quantify the impact of a major change down the process chain. And this is where integrated process prediction will come in. Can we really quantify the impact of a new device, a new process, along the process stream? When we can, it puts us back in the driving seat of implementing the new technology. Because of the risk factor, we can change the risk factor. The mining industry is averse to risk, but when you're talking of the billions that go in and the long-term plan, you can understand why. You can't just change course halfway through a pit. Well, you can, but at extreme expense. So the, the issue here is, is giving confidence in a new process. Otherwise, we can't transform. So to me, this is a platform. Integrated process knowledge, which is the tools underneath, is the platform we can build integrated process prediction on. We do tools. We're good at tools. Why don't we tackle this? And it's, it is broader than the J. So let's just take a journey along there. I've put it down as a linear flow through the process chain, just to link all the, the aspects together. We start with them in, in the ground, we found an ore body. So we take ore body knowledge, which links into the mining. And I suppose a kind of light bulb, it might be an obvious moment, but a light bulb moment to myself and I think a number of my colleagues was actually physically the rock doesn't change, we just make it smaller. 
So this is a photograph of a rock broken into smaller and smaller fragments of photograph, just as we break them down physically, and it stays physically the same. And we, we're just making it smaller. This, we move, make it smaller so we can move it, so we can liberate the minerals, so we can classify it. And then we go to concentration and refine, and 99% goes to, we've got to do something else with it. Put it in a dam, we build a, a waste dump with it. That's in Belize mine, and they, they're putting a tundra back over their waste heaps. Just has a slightly different architecture to the ground, but it'll look the same in the end. Maybe the elk school graze on there again. Um, and if we get it really, do it really well, we might have a rainbow over operation in the society and we'll be happy and the shareholders will be happy. That would be our objective. So let's just look about at this in a little bit more detail. Technically, you should recognise our director there. Um, this is when she was here a few years ago. That's Ernest Henry, or we're looking at Ernest Henry Core, and uh, Dee is also in the photograph. And we're looking at what is in the rock. Let's understand what's in the core of, earth of the rock. So our core knowledge is then what we want to propagate through the entire process, not just um, figuring out whether we're going to mine this bit or that bit, or what's, what's the grade to take the value on. I want the same measurements to be able to predict what the tailings dam is going to look like, not just uh, what bit we're going to mine. So, speaking about primary properties, and I got the term primary properties from John Van in Anglo America when I was presenting this concept to him, and he was really excited. He said, Oh, they're primary properties, oh, what a brilliant word. They don't change, it's a primary property, it doesn't change, it doesn't get destroyed, it's basically conserved. There is a point it will be destroyed, but primary properties will carry a long way through. So that the mineral structure, we might pull them apart, but actually they're still there. So that property of that mineral, or that grain, remains all the way through. So in fact it's sitting in the core that we're looking at. We measure it there and predict how it separates out in the process. We know what it will be like, that particle will be like at the end of the process. That's what I think we should map into the oil, as opposed to proxies or indicators of proxies that then get creeped through the ore body. Uh, I've had a personal rally against that. The trouble is you lose the definition of the information. And those things aren't additive. <coughs> primary properties is not about them being additive. They are the primary properties. What you calculate from them, you can make additive. Okay? So you calculate what you need on the way. Tons per hour through a signal is not a rock property, in case no one noticed that. It is not a property and you should not map it into your body as a public. You should be mapping into your body what that tonnage is dependent on. Because what you're mapping in when you do that, you're mapping in current process and efficiency. It is a particular process with a sagmill recycle crusher with the way you happen to feed it. And that locks you in. If you're going to go transform your capability, you must not map that body, that uh, number, into your body. It's the wrong number to map in. So what you want are the the primary properties that you can calculate your, your processing response to. And we're getting there. I want to know when this pops out the other end of a Zambian copper mine and mill, it's pretty obvious where the copper is. We want to know where that's going to be before we put it through the mill, which bits we should and shouldn't put through, and how we can take advantage of that variability. And then we get to the environment. The mine can be in a mountain, it can be in a jungle, like Bogomol, it can be in a desert, it can be near a city. These dramatically affect how you interact with your body. So you've got the rock signature, now you must interact with the rock. And how you interact depends on your rock. <coughs> and that's where the closer link with our great SMI should really be coming in. How you link that in with your environment. We haven't as an institute taken advantage of that capability. Why not? Because we don't speak the same language at all. So this is about building the language, which is technical, that we can base decisions on from processing through to environment through to social. Now these can be quite different um, mining environments. I've chosen one up in the mountain. And then that rock signature is structurally, we don't really like uh, pitfalls like that, but they, they're a nature of the rock in certain places. We can understand that from the core knowledge. But the geotech and the, the mineral process of the common user are using completely different measures and not talking to each other. Actually, it's the same rock with the same strength, with the same fractures in it, 
And so that's one suite of measurements should give us the common knowledge. And then we have a common knowledge to base our discussion on. That then goes through to how do we blast it and keep Sharma happy. And we can have a good or a bad blast, but I don't think that's a good blast. Um, to design how we're going to extract the, the rock from the process. And we have to deal with this at scale. The scale is enormous. Um, the millions of tons that get moved, hundreds of millions per annum that get moved out of the like this. So whatever we do, we have to understand the scale and the process at scale. When we get it wrong, we can have horrible things like large boulders that really do impact processing. They can put a 5 or 10% bottleneck on a process flow. And we really need to get that understanding of what the, how that will blast and how it will be moved is sitting in the rock, the original rock. Because we really want to dig and drive as fast as we can. Well, alternatively, we want to blow up and convey as fast as we can. So at our tech, our tech believe in, in a hard rock, they've got an input crusher, which then goes up a conveyor belt a couple of kilometers long, and it's wide, it's about six meters wide tunnel going out there, and straight to another conveyor into a new plant. And that transforms the viability of that mine. It, it extended the mine life by 60 or 70 years at half the head rate from what they were before, of the cost of transport in a new, new processing plant. So it was really fascinating. And they planned that 20 years before they started building it. Or if you've got a more friable law, of course, you can use a mobile crush and convey, which is really convenient. And uh, then we should select what we're going to, going to process. We have on the left, a guy doing it manually in a small mine, I think, in northern Queensland. And so I'll take that this way and that that way. It's really efficient for a small mine with one man, but actually in the big process it's not. And it's extremely inefficient to get one professor choosing them rock by rock. So we can select, but that's in effect. So bulk methods of more efficiently selecting within what we call the ore body as opposed to the waste, what we should and shouldn't process, and what different routes they should go on. So the CLC or objective in there absolutely aligns with that sort of thing. We then drive it out in yellow trucks. I've only ever seen yellow trucks, I'm not sure why they're all the other but anyway, yellow trucks. And you can have yellow truck, the traffic jams as I've seen. Because you're now constraining yourself in these big pits and trying to squeeze into them, and they become logistically a nightmare to deal with. So this is a constraint around the processing that should be in the can be in the original plan, of course. Then we get to mine to mill, but this is a different version. This is called handover. It's not the Sharma version of mine to mill or the JPEG. It's the opposite. You dump that truck, and that truck has a really large boulder in it, and then I watch that boulder from that truck sit in that jaw crush for 15 minutes. 15 minutes lost throughput in that gyratory, and that was a bottleneck on the entire process. Had enough milling, enough trucks, truck queue waiting there, it was that crusher. And why was it? Because their, their drilling was put on the blast. So they, those constraints and those legs are really important uh, for us to overcome. And when you go, inevitably, you tend to expand an ore body because it's cheaper to expand than to uh, develop a new one. And your original business case would be on the key ore body. <coughs> so this is KDS uh, expansion number four, if I'm not mistaken. And that's the big HPGR added to the original. The big building has the, the 40 foot sagmal, the first 40 foot sagmal. Clean circuit. Big mill, sagmal, two ball mills, simple. And now it's got conveyors and screens and things linking over and under each other in the nether middle on the side, it is really complex to operate. And we want to try and escape that. The more we can understand the process in advance and plan for it, the better we can be at putting a, a, a simpler to operate uh, process. But we kind of favor a nice big piece of equipment, any boy likes a big piece of equipment, so we're great at that. But that's kind of brute force and ignorance to be to be honest about us. I've dedicated many years to understanding. They are just brute force and ignorance. Um, can we do it more elegantly? So an HPGR, it seems like a more elegant way, low energy consumptions, but then we put it in a 1950s crushing pot and just killed all the advantage as far as I can actually go backwards because now you're driven by our conveyors and mate. So moving on, when we want to do this transformational step, we can't transform by using 50-year-old process technology. 
there's ways of putting that in really neatly that don't have any of those conveyors. That's where we need to move to. And then farm grinding is basically essential as we go into more complex ore bodies, the ones we wouldn't have mined before, processed before. But having an efficient process and knowing when to use it. The interesting one here with most and Tom, who worked here uh, with me for many years, is that uh, they switched that off. They switched the hours a little off because they changed what they were processing. So instead of saying, well, we'll carry on running, they switched off. We don't need it for this all time. And that is part of being uh, more agile, as a common term these days, I think. I call it flexible, <coughs> more agile, in actually processing as and how you need it. You don't want to grind, grind stuff fine if you don't have to. And then we get to classification from coarse to medium to fine. And the fine end is, is really pretty challenging. It's, there's a big push in the industry, but it's really challenging to get it to work efficiently over a wide range of, of conditions. We move from screening through to cyclones, which are the favoured method of uh, classifying by size. And work robustly. The problem is that they're really robust. So you, they get ignored. And I don't think I've been to a site where there isn't a broken cyclone next to a good one, next to a flaring one. I don't think I've ever been to one that doesn't have that. So it's ubiquitous in the industry. We've got a robust piece of equipment that actually is to our detriment. But dealing with these processes becomes an essential part of this, this integration of the, the process be able to highlight where the inefficiencies are and the opportunities are. And what about the physical separation? The older plants had to do this, that small throughputs, and you're really careful what you process now. The, there's a big push to go back to the physical separation, pull stuff out as soon as you can. So what's amenable to gravity magnetic? Quite straightforward technology is just used in a slightly different way. The gigantism of big trucks, big mill, final product float and all precludes the opportunity. So we do have a bit around, we put a gravity circuit around closed with a ball mill, so we use them a bit, uh, but not nearly as much as we could. And then we get to our favourite of flotation. Over the years, you know, 100 years, more than 100 years, and we miraculously attach particles to bubbles to get 70% of the world mineral recovery or something like that. Quite startling. When you express that to people outside the industry, we recover our minerals by floating them on bubbles. It's quite amazing. But there's a lot of, of opportunity in that process. We're taken from lots of cells to big cells. To my naive uh, thought process around flotation, and Kim can jump up and down, that's basically been the progress. We just got bigger. And basically, that's the same as millix, so we, we just did that in that scheme of things. Now we're looking at changing that so it floats different size particles. I think that's going to be the real first real big change in it, uh, that you can move it up the process chain. And when we go through this process of these huge modular cells, at the end, I'm looking at an operator there showing me he's, he's gone through the final cleaning stage and he can see the gang on the bubbles. I don't know how, but he said he could see the gang on the bubble. If he wasn't succeeding getting the right grade out of there. But that grade, those particle properties that are sitting there, we can predict from just looking at the ore. That's our objective. So we know what's going to arrive there and what process they need to solve that problem. Way before we get anywhere. And if you get it right, then you have a smiling, isolated coal water that it's available for the bars of gold. <laughs> and uh, it really is all about the rock. The signatures in the rock. So this should be, this should sing to the geologists. The geologists are going to tell you about most of the stuff wrong. That's really the point. The point is that we need the, the geology from the exploration to the process to the structural to the mining people in our team. I'm trying to attract us together as a team by laying out potential route forward. And how are we doing on tools? So this could be part of the sky. And I think even 10 years ago, it would just be Alcon's having another one of his vision moments. This is a vision with tools that we, we are building. It's a vision that's been subliminal, I guess, for me. So I've been purposely building tools with this, this objective. And it, it just it seemed to cement together uh, during the year before last. And I think it cements together because of the environment, the type of people we have here, and because of our collaborations around the world. But th this is 
animal body, it doesn't matter, but you've got a geological structure. And the work that Barish did around uh, looking at uh, alteration, so replacing surplagia case, I can even say the word, related to the E50, that technology we brought in from Marcella, which was Peter King's original work with Marcella Tavares, and we're looking at what the silk has been, is we developed new ways of measuring it more, let's say, precisely, not sure it's quite the right word, more precisely, and could really differentiate between the different degrees of alteration, quantitatively measured, quantitatively measured through the curve. I checked about seven times with Parrish. He didn't cheat to produce the curve. The curve is straight line. It's just startling. That, that's, and that's 80%. That's 80 it's the 80-20 rule. 80% of the material in that zone of the ore body is purely driven by alteration. And there is a 50% change in strength. Not a 1%, but a 50% difference in strength between it. If we can't use those in our combination models, I think we're not getting anywhere. So that drives what is the information needed in combination models from that detailed fracture work that gives it distribution and strength. And then the next step is how do we how do we integrate that with the mineral structure in there? We still that process is still dealing with that average rock. So we now are on that journey of understanding that and how that goes into and relates to the mineral structure and site. So Rob Morrison started the tomography work here. That's Kathy Evans' image. So there's a concerted work in understanding the 3D placement of the minerals inside and how that affects your strength, your liberation, your mineral deportment. And then we've had a lot of work over the years, to but not only too well on, the, on understanding liberation. What we have a differentiator here from Marco is putting a liberation description that you can carry in an online simulator, carry the information fast, and put it in our process simulation. And that's the difference from detailed work on how a rock will liberate to how a whole stream of rocks will liberate and carry that information through a simulator type, type simulator. Not done yet, done on its own, but there's the tool. We've actually got a tool working that we're trying to prove up now. And then we bring this into the energy, how do we model the, the process in, to bring it into a mill crusher. So we are talking about the size reduction into the primary crusher. How do we bring that information which I've illustrated here in a blast? So what are all the stages we now breaking the rock to liberate it sufficiently to extract the mineral, which is a huge part of the total processing. <coughs> and what kind of measures, simple measures like size, specific energy, uh, the energy intensity curves that can measure and drive the industry behaviour towards an efficient and effective manner of using our energy. And then bring that into our new models. Nice to use DM type images that are cool. But actually we are using the information from there to understand the mechanics of the process so we can use that raw information, that primary property straight in our model. No proxies, nothing in between. Property measured of rock, same property goes into the model, nothing in between. And that same property is the one we can relate to the geology of your body. So I hope you get that feeling, that's the picture we're trying to build. There's nothing in between, there's no fudging in between, and loss of integrity in between. And, and non mechanical breakage like Frank's doing, how do we get that into a process? That's quite a challenge. So how do you get a non mechanical breakage into a physical process? How do you model it? How do you predict its influence inside a process? Having a PAT is, is a useless phenomenon, a useless measure when you deal with that. It's not about the PAT of size reduction. It's about the association of the minerals afterwards. That's the information we need to carry. So you can deduce what is the information you require. How is that going to impact your performance? And the recovery. So we've got an improved recovery with using mechanical and cell frac there. How will that relate to the bubbles you're going to throw the particles at to get to your final rate of recovery? We've been tapping on the store. This is, these are, this is all data we've actually produced. It's about putting it together now to carry the information down the process chain. And when you've got that distribution of minerals, how the mineral association is affecting how it's recovered, can we predict up front, without saying whether, what my mill performance is, what the mineral association will be at a certain point in, in the process? It seems you can, because once you get to a certain size, you can actually work out the distribution of mineral associations. And there we have the map of all of those 
going down to the process site, process chain, and many of which will land up in the tank. Let's just look at a couple of um, a couple of recent tools we say <coughs> that could fit into this. And recent tools and drivers. We've got SARS and percent passing. We know there's a recovery regime where particular could be flotation. Particular equipment has optimal recovery. And we know that we have a whole lot that's too fine and a whole lot that's too coarse. And that's wasted recovery and wasted energy. And often that's wasted recovery as well. It's actually negative and not a positive. So if we can squeeze our product into that box, of course we'll, we will improve it. If we can squeeze it into the box and move it coarser, <coughs> we get a huge change. The majority of the energy is down here. So don't worry about the PA here, because like that moves as well. This is where 80% of the energy is, 90% of the energy. We dramatically drop the amount of work there, we dramatically drop the amount of energy. That graph there is deceptive. That difference means the green line versus the yellow is 10% of the energy, not 90%. It's 10% of the energy. It's quite startling what the difference is. But it's not that easy to chain. You can't just shift that. And you can't just shift it with classification. If you've broken it, you've broken it. The processes we have don't allow us to do that. But we can do it. And if we look at uh, some recent, as yet unpublished work, but really exciting work, uh, gathered by our own students, we've got a, a recovery curve, and we've got a cyclone in the screen, and the material <coughs> coming off the cyclone in the screen, <coughs> on the classification curve, we could see in this particular example neither of them are sitting in the ideal <coughs> regime. This guide to where you want to move the regime to. And interesting here, the cyclone, the dotted line is the mineral size distribution, the solid line is the bulk size distribution. And by putting a cyclone in that preferentially sends the dense material back to the mill, you actually get a finer product from the cyclone. So you can put a screen in with the same cut size and actually be worse potentially. It's a counterintuitive that. This is what we can understand by linking these together. We can understand this driver. Then we put this together, I say we, I said this is a great idea and granted it will work. This is from real data, interestingly, this is the first time we produced it. Which is different recovery at different coarsenesses. So the first one is run amount and the last one is flotation as we get finer. As I pull out 60% mass, how much of the metal will I recover? And the coarser you are, the more metal you lose, the finer you are, the higher, the more metal you, you recover. So you float, you can recover 99% potentially. So that's the curve that we set up on real data, and a little bit smooth, shall we say, but it, it's, it's real and realistic. We put that in, and this I, I, so I meant to divide this into two graphs, but you're all intelligent people, let's go through it in stages. So this is a a one-off, totally new graph produced by power. Let's look at the top half of the graph. We've got recovery on the right, energy on the left. So let's just look at the energy. If you look at the red line, I'm doing 40% mass removal in a single step, either at the ROM, or at the 10, or at the 1, or at the 0.1. I'm just doing at one point, I take 40% of the material. What's the influence going to be on energy? The later I take it out, the more energy I end up using. So I move from about 60% energy, uh, energy to about 75 of the total if I just ran it as a standard circuit. So this is all relative to my standard sag ball and okay. So I'm down to 75% of the energy, that's good. My recovery, which is the purple line, is, sorry, the blue line, the recovery of the blue line, see is 90%. If I pull out the material at the coarse end, I lose a lot of recovery because there's a high risk of losing the ball. And the, the later I do my, I pull out my 40%, the higher my recovery points, and it's right up there, and yet almost a flotation side. But then I've only got a 25% saving energy. I say only, but it's 25%. And basically that's what we do with, say, a copper form for every, we now redrive the concentrate. That's kind of that step. What if I go the other way? This graph is slightly different, the, the process is slightly different. I'm going to take little bits out at a time. 10% at this stage, 10% here, 20% there, 15% here. So I'm building it in stages, and I call that cumulative or staged removal. What if I can do staged removal? 
and I see here, as I, the reason the numbers are different is I'm recovering it in steps. So actually, my, my recovery goes up. So my energy starts low because I don't, didn't need much energy to start. And as I add energy to the process, it's increasing, and I get to 36% of the original energy. Now, if I look at the recovery, the purple line, it slowly goes down because I'm extracting material. Like there's a risk of losing material. But it does finish at 96% recovery for one third of the energy. That seems worth chasing. It actually indicates in this one, you most probably shouldn't remove anything in the role model. But if you do, if you're more careful about knowing what's coming your way, you'd only uh, extract or, or reject material when you're really sure about it. Because if you're only rejecting 10%, you could be picky. You're not 10% on average. I do 50% now, nothing for a day. 70% now, nothing for four hours. And you're more selective about how you remove it. So this allows us to do staged removal, where our first stage can just be putting in a truck and getting rid of it. Our second stage could be uh, CRC grade engineering, where we screen out material that's, of course, material has extremely low grade. We do it with caution because we can make mistakes there at the mine head. But we know what's in your, your ore body to so know where to do it. Now, if I put in one of these stages, I put a, um, a normal size distribution I have through, there's 50% in the size range that's suited, say, to gravity separation or, or to um, doing an optical sorting or something like that. There's always quite narrow, those can be really narrow size ranges. If I now move it so I have a steeper, the green curve, there's more material I could sort or, or work on in that stage. So there's great advantage to controlling not just at the end, but all the way along, that I have a narrower size of solution. A controllable one that there's more of it that's um, suited to my upgrade process. Because the stuff outside the box, I don't even put through it, I screen out. <coughs> I don't even look at it. It's only the stuff in the box I'm even looking at. So the more I put in the box, the better upgrade I can have really on. And then that goes, as I go finer, I can stick to that optimal route and then move this whole process, as I explained before, to give stage from upgrade. So the, the brown lines are where I can take substrate recovery, and the blue line, the return, is if I'm pulling out stuff early, I'm going to get way better water recovery. Water recovery is driven by the real fines, the 10 micron, 20 micron. So if I'm pulling stuff out of a micron, I can get 100% water recovery. It's like beach sand. So, I put it the GCC, collaboration is essential. We don't have all the tools yet, but we can be the drivers. We have the most, most of the tools and the platforms, so we can be in the driving seat of us. And it comes down to control as well, as I said before. You've got to guess which one is me and which one is Alan Bar. <laughs> so uh, we've got to be able to move that into the operation, not just into the design, because that's where they make the profit or the loss. And my favourite is the flexi circuits, but the, this is a concept which was then done on really basic energy numbers, and now we're moving up the process with students working on this. But how do we really simulate that? The green bits, I'm rejecting material early on, and I've got a flexible way of, of balancing my equipment. The objective here is 60% reduction in energy, like I showed in that stage upgrade. So, an increase in metal recovery in, in this instance because actually you've seen a higher grade to flotation and uh, more metal production. That's surely worth chasing. And that's driven me in this process. Well, I realise you can't do it in isolation. You have to have a bigger picture to, to simulate that and fit it in the mind plan to take the industry on that path. And that's the summary to inspire you to ask some really fun, interesting, challenging questions of where does this path take us, what are the tools, I purposely put technical tools in to show it's not a path dream, I think we're a lot closer there than people outside the organisation would think. So thank you for attention and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much Malcolm, that was very thought provoking and as you said um, it's interesting we're doing this kind of started this process like two years ago and it was it was more looking into the future and what we could achieve into the future. It's amazing seeing these tools come online that actually fit in with this picture and and 
give some tangible benefits along the way. And I think that idea of, of 96% recovery and 36% of the energy um, is a real interesting, sorry, the screen's doing all kinds of weird things. But <laughs> it's, I haven't tried this program before, so it's hard. Um, but yeah, that, that should spark some um, thoughtful questions from the, from the audience. So I'll open the floor to, to questions. We've got, we've got a bit of time. Standard. Yes, yes. the back. Okay. I think this good vision is good, but the basic input is the rock. That's what you're saying. Okay? And I find there's a big problem there. But what the, the information that we get from the rock is getting from the exploration mode, I think Travis, you can tell me the uh, spacing of the exploration mode and the accuracy of these. Why? What we do is we make interpolation. Okay? So, one of the problems which I've heard with all this thing is our ability to accurately predict what is in the ground. That is very poor to start. So, how are you going, to, unless we address that one, how are you going to do? You, can, you may be developing fantastic tools all the way to predict it, but if your input is not accurate, how are you going to predict your processing? So the secret plan, the one I argue with Alice repeatedly, lies in, uh, you can't see it, it's a tiny image over there, is the, the geological model. This is why I just have geologists in, in the party. I can't start without them. Instead of blindly interpolating between holes, we map the properties which are, the, which are based on geological properties into the geological model. So I presented that at GeoMed conference and some people were excited and some looked at me strangely. But to me that's the route because then you actually know where the, the faults are, what the structure is. And if, we, if we're mapping the properties that the geologist is measuring, in other words we need to be together in the same language, so we're mapping um, the same properties, then that gives us the macro model way better than we could have possibly got otherwise. And as we go to, to the development holes, of course we'll improve the resolution. But keeping the geological model all the time, and updating that, not ignoring it, and finding me, my limited experience of looking at, at how that's dealt with in the mind pit, because that's kind of forgotten about, and we just look at the last page, and we move on. And actually we know there's a whole structure underlying it. We should be integrating that, that information. But if the information is in different pans, in different language, in different mathematical programs, you don't bring it together. And that, that to me is the challenge. It's not new information, it's just putting, it's the big data. It's the digitization, it's just putting it together. We need to use those words to get the funding. Okay. That to me is, is the path. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, there's not a unique solution in the geological model. It's pretty much two holes. So you're expecting us to, to get it right, 100% right. You know, it's a, to, to model between those holes, it's a mixture of you know, geological intuition and interpretation, and quite often there, it's a, it's a singular model that comes out. And it might just be one or two geologists who are responsible in their mind for producing that model. So it's, it's not going to be right. There are tools in, you know, in the geophysics space to, to give us more information about what's happening between holes, but it's expensive. And I don't think we can. I don't think we've solved the, the value proposition as to why we should spend that extra money to collect more data between holes. I, I think that, that's the right word, Travis. They are currently. We got we got tools to get a better definition of what is in between those two holes. The question is, as the writer said, we haven't developed the value proposition to say that. Why we need to do that? I think that's what it is. Why we need to do that, and what is the value of that to the industry to get a better definition between those two points? I think this process, as far as it could help us to find that because we could use the information more intensively all the way up the process. Um, yeah, thanks, Margaret. As, uh, as Grant says, thoughts provoking, so it's provoked a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, a comment and two questions. The comment is you're, you're understandably rude about things like we shouldn't populate um, uh, information.
promotion with the throughput, we should populate it with the fundamental properties. Uh, I think you've got to remember where we come from. And I remember uh, going to a mine in Indonesia a few years ago where I was very proudly shown the mine plan heavily populated with throughput. And that was a fantastic advance over what we've gone before. So I think I just need to remind everybody that I think what you're saying is that's a good step on the road, but the vision is for something much beyond that. So that's the comment. The I'll let the wording in, because I agree with you. Okay. It's two, a step on the path. The two questions are, I haven't heard the word cost, I think, yet in your presentation. So one question is, um, in your vision, uh, it's great to save 60% uh, you know, of energy and get 25% more production and all these things sound impossible, but I think they're doable with the right tools. But but then you show a flow sheet that's, that looks very expensive to me. So that's the first question, is, is there a cost issue? Second question is, is more important really to this place is, what are you going to then sell to the industry? What would you like industry to pay for that will A, excite them enough to pay for it in the first place, and B, will materially uh, contribute to the implementation of this vision? So the two questions are the cost and what do you sell to the industry? The cost thing is, if you do this right and you do the state upgrade, there'll be less equipment in that circuit. And that's, a, a, that's not the ultimate circuit, but that circuit actually has way less than if you had two big tangles with recycled pressures. It has less in it. And it doesn't have the conveyors of Kenya. So, developing the circuit layout, which Marco started doing, what, what are the conveyors and what feeds into what circuit, what's the capsule equipment, is a step down the path. But we haven't, as we say, attracted the funding to support us spending time on it. We've tried a number of times to get in there and not managed to. Kind of draws us to mission number two. How do we convince industry? I think that is that is my challenge and my my approach is as I introduce it. That we need uh, we need to penetrate industry from the top down on this. And what's the level? that they would expect to see to support an initiative like that, like this. So this is given quite deliberately in a more technical sense at this stage. Part of that is because I want to get the technical people in the room first. And then we, we can go to industry with the team assembled with the vision of a clearer. The problem pragmatically is doing that without any funding at this stage to do that. So where do we get the seed funding? And I don't but it seems like the right kind of thing to go to a university if you're going to support us strategically. This is the type of area because it is really the big strategic, potentially the big strategic underlying, not I want support in this project, this project, this project. It's this because all the projects will build on of it. And that's what we are bringing in the big industry moment. Can you split it up in parts, each part of which has its own attraction that you could sell as a separate project because people would like to have it now? Yeah, so the, the, the sub-breaking up, which we're pretty good at in this institute, is a brief version of this becomes, here's the vision of what we're doing, and we'll, we'll do this project with you, but it'll also lead to that and that. It's not, this will come to the end and then we'll ask you to do something else and something else. So this bit of work we're doing on using the silk to break rocks and develop a new model out of that, that has value because it'll go into the mill model, which will go into the geology model which will go into the tailings model, then the industry should see way more value than I just got another package test. I think uh, being able to express that clearly is what we need to do now to, to get the business case up for funding ourselves to do this work. But it's not an easy one. The big things are never easier. We need another energy. Exactly. Send you out there to do an energy. That is exactly the right answer. <laughs> I don't think that's beyond the bounds of possibility. Yeah. I feel like we've got enough content in here to launch it if we spend the time on constructing technical content that's not planned. So. Yeah, um, I guess this is a lot of the space I'm trying to get to with my PhD. But um, one, one thing that really strikes me about what you're trying to do here is um, re-look at how we uh, exploit resources. And if you've already built your mine and built your plant, you're not going to be able to implement this sort of approach in a bigger sense. So to, to, to apply this sort of approach, you're really going to have to get to people who are considering what to do with an order's company. 
or a minimal discount. And um, you, you're really going to have to teach a lot of people how to approach things differently and, and work in an integrated way. And, and to me that means teaching, uh, I guess, the professionals who are involved in that process how to do things differently. Uh, which will mean you know, redesigning undergraduate programs, um, talking to the people that do this work in terms of how they exploit the resources. Um, and, and that to me is part of the bigger challenge of uh, getting to get a, a, a new holistic view in there. Um, that, that to me is what, what's going to take a lot of the time, re-educating people to get out of their silos and get a more, um, I guess, become more renaissance people in all this extraction. Now, if the engineering companies can't follow the process, then you're going to process design like that. And it, it's a really good point on the education is that in the university setting, there might be a really good book into the university's mineral processing courses back down to four, I think. This is a more attractive proposition to give to students, that you, you bring people student from multiple faculties into a course like this is a potential, I think, be a great education, a, a new platform for education as well. I see a volunteer. Any <laughs> <laughs> other question? Yeah, thanks, Malcolm. Um, just sort of returning to the uh, comments around the geology, I can see the geologists sort of feeling a bit of a heavy burden here. Like they have to do everything up front and then we've got that information. We can do all the rest of but the reality of it is, is that we are constrained on how much data and what data we can collect at each stage through this process. So it seems to me that integrated process knowledge was it's, it's technically the way to go. It has to be married to uh, inline or online rock measurement all the way through the process as well. As we drill holes into the bench, we've got 150 to 500 more holes actually sampling that rock. And on the drill head, we're getting measurements of, of rock strength. That information is to carry to the next stage as some you call them proxies, but it is some kind of measure of those underlying physical properties. If we understand the relationship between those, we can carry those physical properties without <coughs> Travis and the other geologists to have a connection that will somehow change the way that they characterize the old body up front. What, what's your comments on that? I think you've seen Charmaine Contenza's music here. Yeah. Absolutely. So they, you refine the data as you go to get more drill holes and you can justify the data because of what you can do with it. I can immediately feed forward to the mill because that's how my model is set up. I don't need, actually still I need the proxy because if we get the measure while drilling, the force of the bit on the rock will be giving us the measurement of the rock strength, which is the measurement we have. So it might be a, a less accurate one, but it's the same measure as what our objective would be. And then that goes straight into the model. There's no, no fiddling. It goes straight in. That's what I'd see the objective to be. And the, then you, 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 you're enriching it by using not just that knowledge, but the knowledge of what is the, the geological structure in that area and the mineralogy informs you what that data is because the, the force on its own is not enough. So we enriching it with the other information. It really does lead into the, the big data, but it's big data with intelligence. Which I prefer us having. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, my question is regarding the, um, I kind of didn't see much about the mine plan and the mine operation and the way the scale that we're operating, like we've not selected enough to. Mm -hmm. So I would like to hear your comments on uh, how would this scheme work with the mine planning, the way the mine planning is made, and how selectivity of the operation uh, is going to be accounted for in this kind of scheme. But they, you pick on my weak point where I need someone on the team, which is good. Because that exactly highlights why we need those mine planning on the team. But what I can tell you is it gives the information for the mine planning that we're lacking. So the definition of what's the processability of the rock, not just the grade. What is the processability? What's its structural properties going to be? What is the processability for magnetic separation, physical separation, for low grade, upgrade, for leach? We have better definition of that within that bench, say. And that helps plan well in advance 
uh, where that should go, like what your mind plan would be. And I think it will help justify what Sean was talking about and Travis was worried about, is improving that definition. Well, it's worth drilling some more in this area, not a blanket of holes 20 metres apart across the entire mine site. But actually, this is the area where the least sure and it's, it's where the great differentiation is, a bit like we're talking on a bench scale. Let's go and get the definition just where we need it to, to populate that, that information because it's about mine planning. I need to know, you know, there's a seam going through here. Actually, that border is what I want to know. Not what's inside the seam, I can deal with it. Not what's outside. I need to work with the borders. And I'll focus on that too. The bit you're saying, Travis, is, you know, everyone will have a slightly different model, or dramatically different. We now know we're targeting what information we need to improve the model. With a, with a greater purpose, it's going to affect the mind planning, the processing, what, what process route I send that, those particles through, they're all just particles. So we're moving to particle space, property distributions, particle property distributions. I think we've got time for one more question, and I'm going to have to go off back for that, and we'll continue the questions afterwards. I've got, I brought biscuits to go with the team, <laughs> so we can chat on <laughs> You said that um, at the planning stage that people are very conservative because they don't want to risk spending millions or millions or whatever it is on setting up something new, which they don't know if it's going to work. Yeah. But this is all about something new. Is there a way of bringing this in at, you know, at a, you know, to an existing plant that's not going to um, cost a fortune in the capital overheads so they can actually yeah. gain the benefits without um, without having to put the massive overheads and the risk um, associated? Are they, actually, it comes to the other part of the question. So they, Yes, actually on the current plant you can because you can use it in expansion. So my route is to use it on, on a ground <coughs> in an expansion sense. What could I do when KD wants to get another 20% to big plant? Or, you know, Cortez or someone wants to get 20% more. It's not worth putting another side in. So you end up with things being patched onto a plant and that's why they get so complex. Well, can we use this method to, to identify what should take a different process step? What we shouldn't mill, so we just stick with the mills we've got. No, we've got enough milling. Actually, we're just going to change what goes to the mill and what doesn't go to the mill, with maybe quite a small process in between, not another mill. You know, a screen, a physical upgrade, a change in, the, in what we select. One twenty percent of the rock goes to a small process that just does a, a crush in gravity, and then only the only the concentrate goes to the mill. I, I think that's the path, because that's the lower risk. And the, the, risk, the, the plus side is putting the other mill is not economically feasible to the, mill, to the mine. So I said, well, I can't do that at all. This route is economically feasible, so you change the risk profile to make it viable. We do need to be able to speak the risk language. So. Well, thank you very much, Malcolm. That was a, um, I thought it was a fascinating presentation. And I think, um, once again, I said thought provoking, but I think it, it provides um, the researchers with a kind of um, scope for how to move forward and how all our potential research can actually link together into a greater platform. Um, but it also puts out those, those um, calls to can we do better? Can we use less energy? Can we recover more? Can we do it with a lower footprint? Um, environmental impact, social impact, I think that's a, that's a really good thing to keep in people's minds. Um, when we're head down on the technical details every day of the week. So thank you very much and join me and thank you very much.